Good morning. Good afternoon to our participants in Europe. My name is Ken Kropp, Senior Fellow at the Atlantic Council Europe Center, and it's my pleasure today to host this discussion on the new EU-US data privacy framework. What is it and will it last? This is the latest in a series of programs that the Atlantic Council Europe Center uh, runs on transatlantic data policy. And I'm very pleased that we have with us today uh, two of the principal negotiators of this new agreement, uh, Alisa Vekeman, uh, head of the Transatlantic Data Flows Unit in uh, the European Commission's Directorate General for Justice, uh, and Alex Greenstein, Director of the Privacy Shield Office, or what was formerly called the Privacy Shield Office uh, at the US uh, Department of Commerce. Uh, they are each going to give uh, some introductory remarks. And after that, we will hear comments from two leading experts whose collective experience spans government, academia and private legal practice, uh, Christopher Kuhner of the Brussels Privacy Hub and the Wilson Sonsini Law Firm, and Jocelyn Aqua, Privacy and Ethics Leader at PwC uh, US Consulting and uh, previously uh, Department of Justice National Security Attorney. Then we will be opening the floor to, to audience questions. We would ask that you can A them using the audience QA feature on your screen and follow us, uh, if you'd like, on Twitter at AC uh, Europe. And finally, uh, just to note that today's discussion is on the record. So in March, uh, European Commission President von der Leyen and US President Biden announced agreement on a new EU-US data privacy framework. And now, six months later, the president has issued an executive order uh, implementing the U.S. commitments under the data privacy framework, and the U.S. Justice Department issued an accompanying administrative rule establishing a new data protection review court to be housed within the Department of Justice. Both the executive order and the uh, regulation are lengthy and very substantial documents. Uh, they're the result of detailed negotiations between Washington and Brussels that began indeed just months after uh, the Schrems II ruling by the European Court of Justice uh, invalidating uh, the application of the privacy shield. The European Commission in turn has announced that it will now prepare uh, a draft decision finding the new data privacy framework to be an adequate basis under the EU's general data protection regulation for personal data transfers from EU territory to the United States. And Elisa will be giving us some, some details on that. The new data privacy framework comes at uh, a crucial moment. It will address what has been a steadily worsening environment for transatlantic data transfers over uh, the, the past two years. We have seen a series of rulings uh, from European data protection authorities in recent uh, months questioning and in some cases even stopping transfers of, uh, trans of data on a transatlantic basis made under uh, the terms of so-called standard contract clauses. There are two main features to the new deal that has just been announced. One is uh, that US intelligence agencies have committed to engage in foreign surveillance only where necessary and proportionate and we'll try to unpack uh, what those terms mean in this context a little bit. And second, the establishment of the new US Data Protection Review Court as a form of independent redress for individuals. And again, we will talk about uh, what independence means uh, in this particular setting. Uh, now I would like to turn to uh, our, our governmental uh, representatives to unpack a few of the details, uh, beginning with Alex Greenstein. Alex, the floor is yours. All right. No, thank you very much, Ken, for having me today. And it's uh, really good to sort of uh, see you all and be able to share with you sort of the results of um, a uh, considerable amount of effort by both the United States government um, really a whole of government effort on the US side, as well as sort of the um, our partners from the European Commission. We really did put a lot of work into this, and I think this is going to have significant benefits in terms of 
um, bringing stability to the transatlantic data flows, and then also sort of benefiting sort of the US economy, national security, and um, our relationship with the European Union, and also sort of the uh, EU's interest in those areas as well. Um, so the executive order that was issued, um, I guess a week ago, Friday, um, implements sort of the commitments that were on the EU US data privacy framework that were announced by President Biden and von der Leyen back in March. Um, this is sort of aimed at sort of restoring stability to the transatlantic data flows relationship. Um, and I'd really like to thank Alyssa and her colleagues for their partnership in this effort. It's really been um, a uh, long time coming, but I think we have reached a really uh, good outcome here. And so the deal does include robust commitments, strengthening uh, safeguards for signals intelligence um, around particularly necessity and proportionality, addressing sort of the concerns raised by the SHREMS 2 decision, um, and also addresses SHREMS 2 with regards to um, redress by creating a new mechanism for EU individuals to seek redress if they believe that they're unlawfully targeted. Um, we really sort of were very forward leaning on that and really sort of went quite far in terms of what we can do sort of within the United States system. And I think um, these commitments address the concerns raised by like uh, the Court of Justice and the SHREMS 2 decision. Um, and also say that sort of these commitments on national security will cover um, all data transfers to the United States under sort of SCC's binding corporate rules and also eventually a future adequacy decision for the um, data protection framework. Um, in parallel, we're also sort of working with our partners in the European Commission um, to facilitate their sort of issuing an adequacy determination. We're um, working to finalize updates to um, commercial uh, privacy principles that will sort of be a part of the data privacy framework. Um, and that should be um, finalized in the near future and that will uh, allow the commission to um, conduct an adequacy determination and that will go through sort of the EU processes. Um, and then also sort of like, yeah, we'll be working to um, manage sort of like, you know, the transition of companies who are currently participating in Privacy Shield um, and make sure that they're able to make the transition to the data protection frame, data privacy framework. I think I'll leave it there and um, uh, let Alyssa jump in. Okay, um, Alyssa, um, why don't you um, offer some views for us from Brussels and then uh, we'll move to um, some questions for both of you. Thank you. Sure. Um, good morning. Good afternoon, everyone. I, I hope you can hear me well because I was having some connection issues earlier. I hope it's okay now. Um, so indeed, I wanted to briefly explain what these two new instruments are about. So the new executive order and the attorney general regulation and what this means for the new or the future transatlantic data transfer framework. Um, so as was already mentioned, these two instruments are the outcome of quite intense negotiations that focus specifically on, on the two aspects that were raised by the Court of Justice in the Schrems II judgment. So the limitations and safeguards that apply to um, the collection of data by U.S. intelligence agencies. Um, and then on the other hand, the availability of effective redress mechanisms for individuals. So the purpose of our negotiations was really to develop a framework that addresses um, these two issues. And this is what these two new instruments do. So first of all, the executive order introduces new safeguards that ensure that um, when data is accessed by national intelligence agencies in the US, this is done in a way that is limited to what is necessary and proportionate for national security. Um, so these new safeguards are binding, and I think it's important to mention that they will apply to any individual, so regardless of nationality or, or place of residence. Um, to a large extent, I mean, they, they've taken, I think, existing instruments like Presidential Policy Directive 28 as a starting point, but they also go further. So they essentially apply the principles of necessity and proportionality to each different step of uh, surveillance activities. So, for example, the executive order um, already defines what are considered legitimate objectives for which surveillance can be conducted. So, for instance, uh, the fight against terrorism. 
And it also lists certain objectives for which uh, surveillance can never take place. So for example, um, for the purpose of suppressing dissenting political opinions. Um, then as a next step, the, the executive order also contains certain safeguards that apply to the collection stage. So basically framing how, under which conditions and in which circumstances uh, signals, signals intelligence can take place and also contains certain rules on what happens to data once it has been collected. So in terms of how long it can be conditions, it can be used uh, or shared with third parties. And then finally, all of this is also complemented by certain procedural safeguards to make sure that all of this um, is uh, also um, uh, complied with in all operational phases of um, intelligence operations. And then indeed, as was already mentioned, there was also a, a second aspect uh, that our negotiations focused on is the, the creation of a new redress mechanism. Um, this is also done by the executive order and by the attorney general regulation. And this new redress mechanism consists of two layers. So first of all, individuals will have the possibility to complain to the civil liberties and um, privacy officer of the office of the director of national intelligence. And then as a second layer, individuals will have the possibility to appeal to a new body that will be created. So the Data Protection Review Court or DPRC. Um, and this is a new body that I can say, I, I think maybe we'll get to there later in a bit more detail, but it's it's very different from the mechanism that was in place under the privacy shield. It's uh, it's fully independent and it has stronger powers than, than the previous ombudsperson. It really has uh, its own investigatory powers and the power to take binding decisions. Um, and these safeguards in the area of national security, as Alex already mentioned, they will complement the obligations that apply to companies in the US that will want to subscribe to the new framework and import data from the EU on that basis. Uh, so the combination of, of this entire package, this is what forms the basis for uh, the future adequacy decision that the European Commission will issue, uh, because that will be the, the next step. Um, the Commission will propose a draft adequacy decision on this basis, and then we will launch with that uh, the adoption procedure on our side. And just to explain a bit that uh, this involves different steps. So first, we will have to obtain an opinion from the European Data Protection Board, which is the body at EU level that brings together all national data protection authorities from the EU member states. After that, we will also uh, need to obtain the green light from the EU member states. And of course, all of this takes place under the scrutiny of the European Parliament. Um, I know everyone always wants to hear uh, how long this will take and when a new adequacy decision will be in place. Um, as you can imagine, because of these different procedural steps, it's very difficult to give a concrete timeline. But what we can say is that based on our experience with previous decisions, usually uh, if everything goes well, it takes about six months between the proposal of a draft decision and the adoption of the final one. And then a last comment I, I just wanted to make, it's also linked to, to what Alex was saying before. And I think it's important to note that all of the safeguards that indeed have been agreed with the US and that are in this executive order and attorney general regulation, they will not only form the basis for a new adequacy decision, but they will of course also apply to any commercial transatlantic data transfer. So companies using other tools like standard contractual clauses or binding corporate rules, they will all benefit from, from the same protections. And we think this will of course significantly facilitate uh, transatlantic data flows. And I will stop here for now, thank you. Thank, thank you, Elisa, for that, that very substantive um, presentation. Um, to, to start to uh, unpack some of the elements of it, um, I'd like to, to turn now to, uh, to Chris Kuhner. Um, Chris has been uh, one of the leading observers of the transatlantic data saga over, over the last couple of decades. Um, Chris, um, what do you make of this latest effort? Well, thank you very much, Ken, and, and uh, thanks very much to the Atlantic Council for inviting me on this very interesting webinar. I have to say that I'm, I'm a bit, uh, I, I won't say speechless, but it, it, it's difficult to know what to, what to say in five minutes about all this. Uh, it's such a, such a highly complex topic. Uh, and so I'm going to limit myself just to, to two points, and I'm, I'm sure there will be plenty of, of questions afterwards. Uh, first of all, uh, I'm very, I've been very interested to, to hear and read not only 
what's been said here, but in other other things in the media and in the privacy community, talking about a new that now we have a new transatlantic data privacy framework. Uh, it, it doesn't seem to me that this is really a new transatlantic data privacy framework in terms of what was announced. What what, have, what has been issued in the last few days were two two sets of measures issued unilaterally adopted by the U.S. Uh, to to help. Uh, protect privacy and the signals intelligence, or the, I guess it's the national security bulk processing arena, which is certainly a, a very important topic and was indeed uh, one of the major focuses of the latest uh, Schrems judgment, but it's not in itself really a, a data, a, a privacy framework. Uh, uh, we, we need to see a lot more be, be, before we have really a complete framework. So uh there there are other issues which are not involved here for example uh law enforcement access of u.s authorities and the cloud act that's not from what i can see is not dealt with here here we're talking about signals intelligence uh it, it seems to me maybe i'm because i'm I, I like to be a careful lawyer and only opine on what i actually have in black and white that we need to to look over the next few years and see a number of different steps that will occur so that this is really just the beginning of building a privacy framework rather than being the whole framework by itself. So uh, we need to see, first of all, the issuance of the commission adequacy decision. Now, it sounds like that's sort of a done deal, which in its, is, it's interesting to hear in itself. But uh, uh, if this is brought to the court of justice, that's the document that they will look at. They, they, the court of justice does not sit there and, and and opine on on law of the US or any other country they will they will look at the commission uh, decision so that's I think will be really the key document which we all have to look at when it's when it's issued uh, in the next few months then there will have to be uh, some it, it, assuming that this this would be challenged that there would be some case brought before a national court or data protection authority this court or authority would have to refer it to the court of justice they would then issue a judgment. All of this will take several years. So really, th th there's a lot that's going to happen now. This is a very important step, and I, I don't want to in any way minimize the achievement here, which does seem to me to be significant, but really we're, we're, we're a ways away from a, from a complete a, a accepted transatlantic data privacy framework. Uh, my second point is that I think we should remember that beyond the legal issues, what's very important here is trust. Uh, and that's what I think these, these uh, documents are supposed to build. Uh, remember the previous experience under the privacy shield in the, in the interregnum uh, between when it, was, when it was adopted and when the, when the Schrems II judgment came out, when it was legally valid, uh, there were quite a, a, quite a number of, of uh, companies in Europe which simply didn't want to use it. So if they were, if they had a business partner in the U.S. saying you could transfer data to us under the privacy shield, they would say, "Sorry, we don't trust it. Uh, it's being challenged legally. Uh, there are all sorts of things, negative things, being said about it in the media, in the press, in the business community. So it seems to us a bit shaky. So we don't, we don't want to use it." Uh, and I think that's that's what will really be important here is how how is this new framework accepted in the marketplace? Uh, will people trust it? Uh, you know, if if it's very quickly challenged, if there's a cloud over it, then uh, we, we may see that it's not quite as as useful as it could be. Uh, so I, th I think we really have to wait a bit to see what the commission decision says, how this is all accepted in the, in the marketplace uh, among companies uh, before we can really say for certain that we have a, a, a strong framework, transatlantic framework, which is stable in the long term. So I think I've exhausted my allotted five minutes and I'll turn the floor back to Ken. Thank you, Chris, for um, those cautions and, and particularly for, uh, for flagging uh, the other issues that, that remain uh, unresolved um, in the transatlantic data area, particularly law enforcement access. Um, Jocelyn, um, it seems to me that 
as as someone who counsels companies these days, you may uh, be in a position to uh, to address the the issue of trust that that Chris has mentioned here. But I would I would also ask you to put your your former hat on uh, from uh, the Justice Department National Security Division. You labored long and hard on on PPD twenty eight. Um, uh, how does this, uh, how do the commitments made by the U.S. government um, in, in this new context compare to, to those in the earlier one? Um, sure, and thanks, Ken and, and everyone for having me here. Um, I was very excited to have the opportunity to read um, this, all of the documentation that just came out over the past week with um, excitement and, and curiosity on how um, I, the executive order was going to address some of those key issues that were um, caused uh, uh, the privacy shield to become invalidated. And I think they did quite an amazing job. While uh, a lot of the scope and the purpose for, for um, national security collection has not changed, um, there, uh, there are already some significant limitations focused on, on key national security concerns of the U.S. and its allies, focused on terrorism and espionage, and, and, but not on, um, on certain areas of discriminatory effect on, on, um, on, on different people. And so I think the focus solely on treatment and continued parity of all persons, not just U.S. persons, was really well, was really a welcome um, thing to read. And that um, really is throughout the entirety of the of the new executive order. Um, so two, two areas that I thought were, was quite interesting. One was, again, the necessity, necessity and proportionality which um, the terms are defined in the EO, so a little bit different from how it's defined in case law in the EU. I noticed that um, that while um, I don't know if, if people have had a, ever a chance to review, but the EDPS in, in the EU had written some white papers on what is necessity and what is proportionality. They focus a lot on strict, strict necessity and focus on um, proportionality at that individual, um, individual rights stance. This is really focused on necessity in terms of, um, of it's very important and there's a limited uh, ability to obtain that intelligence in another way. And the proportionality is really um, very broad, focused on, on the effect in a balancing um, test, which I thought was a, a real um, good way to, to sort of split that assessment with a keynote that they'd be focusing on US law. In, in its interpretation, which of course makes sense. Um, the area of redress is quite amazing. They leverage a lot of different um, existing um, ways that we handle um, administrative review. Um, first, um, the qualification of the verification of the complaint was, was a good idea, and that's being done by regulators in the EU. It's similar to the plan that um, is in place for financial records under the TFTP, the transnational um, agreement. Um, then having that qualified complaint go to ODNI's um, civil liberties officers is a really good step as a first layer. They have um, garnered a lot of trust both in the United States and the EU for their scrutiny over um, activities. And they do have a right to seek all of that information from, um, from from the different intelligence communities, and then also that for that the, um, the the court. I mean, that is something that we haven't seen in this context before. Giving a court independent authority to say yes or no with respect to whether or not a um, a, a complaint is um, valid and something should be done, whether or not they're able to tell that individual that something specific has been done. The fact that all of those parties are involved is quite amazing. And then uh, again, having the transparency and the review of the PCLOB, the Privacy and Civil Liberties Overview Oversight Board, to have them really also be able to look at the individual procedures of, of the intelligence communities, um, the, the folks that are actually reviewing signals intelligence, and then that annual review. I mean, it is quite an overlapping level of scrutiny for an individual complaint. Um, so I think that's quite impressive and a big difference from the initial um, PPD. 
Um, very quickly with respect to corporations, I think people are breathing a sigh of relief. Um, this is a, a chance to, to take a step back and, and really either decide to use the Privacy Shield um, renewed, I'm not sure what it's going to be called now, um, um, the data protection framework that um, Alex spoke of that should be um, coming out in the next um, few weeks, I, I believe. Um, that really will help those thousands of companies that relied on Privacy Shield. So I know they're breathing a sigh of relief. Um, the others who have already um, engaged in binding corporate rules or standard contract clauses, I'm not exactly sure that they will pivot since they have so many contracts, thousands of contracts, many big companies already in play with um, standard contract clauses within. Um, that said, I think the overall um, position is that these companies have, cons uh, have more um, relief that they can actually rely on their agreements and their use of cloud providers that are, that are based in the United States or technology providers that are based in the United States so that data doesn't necessarily all have to be stored in Europe, which was a result of all of this, that there was all of this bifurcated localization occurring because of fear that using um, US providers and having data come into the United States was so risky for corporations. I'm, I'm hoping that despite the fact that this is not completely finalized, that the regulators who have been investigating the use of analytics and um, tools where the data can flow back into the United States is not of such great concern anymore because of the fact that the US has agreed to make these significant changes to its um, intelligence processes. Um, we'll, we'll have to see, I hear what Chris is saying in terms of trust. I think there is strong trust between the two, the two governments at this point. Um, we'll have to continue to showcase that trust to make sure that it trickles down to the individual member states. Um, the only last thing I'd be interested to, to hear more about from uh, everybody on, on this call is that um, companies really need to focus on their transfer impact assessments. This has been a huge burden for many companies. And the truth is, is that it's so difficult for, for a corporation to be able to be able to assess the um, collection protocols and the laws of all of the different countries they do business with that impact the EU. So in this instance, I think they can have um, the ability to streamline their TIAs for the United States. But then again, the U.S. has now said that they are going to be looking to the um, basically the essential equivalence and adequacy of other countries where their U.S. where U.S. data is sent over to those countries. I'd be interested how they're going to be doing this for the EU, since member states um, have have um, have maintained their own national security regimes, and it's really outside the scope of the European Commission. And so I'm curious to see what the US government will be doing, whether they will be looking at the EU as a whole, whether they're gonna be looking at different member states. And then as this continues across the globe, how they're going to be really assessing to see whether or not the, the country is qualified to have US person data. I think that should help in a, in a secondary fashion, the ability of corporations to really understand how data is being collected and used by other countries, maybe that might help in the TIA processes that they have to go through. Um, I'll leave it at that and, um, and look to you, Ken, for additional questions. Th thank you, Jocelyn. Um, and uh, thank you especially for raising that last question, which <clears throat> was going to, to be my first um, actually to, to pose. Um, I'd like to, to turn to Elisa and and just ask her, um, how, how does the commission view this um, essentially reciprocity element that the U.S. has, has now injected into the equation, where, where the U.S. will be looking at uh, uh, due process protections and uh, free flow of data protections in, in other countries? The, the provision applies both to regional economic integration organizations like the EU, but also to, uh, to individual countries. And it's no secret that there are um, uh, a, a few countries even within the EU where um, uh, rule of law issues do, do exist in, in relation to data transfers. So 
Um, how how does the commission view uh, this this assertion of reciprocal rights by the United States? Um, yeah, I mean, first, I'm not sure I would call it reciprocity. I mean, I was as was already pointed out also before. In the end, this is not um, an international agreement. That there has been a unilateral process on U.S. side. Now there will be unilateral process on on the EU side to adopt an adequacy decision. Um, but indeed, it's it's what is true is that the, this new redress, redress mechanism will in general be available to those countries and, and organizations that will be designated uh, by the US through a specific process. It will be a designation by the attorney general. Um, and indeed, the executive order also makes clear that this designation can be done for individual countries or for um, economic regional organizations, which uh, in our view, would the, the latter would apply uh, to, to the EU. Um, I think for us, what matters, of course, because we, as I said, we have these two unilateral processes, but for the, the EU to be able to propose an adequacy decision, for us, it's, of course, essential that all the different elements are in place, which also means that the redress mechanism is fully established and, 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 and functioning, and uh, it is available to all EU individuals, because also an adequacy decision uh, is, is an instrument that is adopted and applies across the EU. It would facilitate data transfers from all EU member states and the three EEA countries, so uh, Iceland, Norway, and Liechtenstein. Mm -hmm. So, of course, for us to even be able to adopt an adequacy decision, it's uh, the redress mechanism needs to be there and needs to be available to, to all individuals. So I would say that this is our, our perspective on this. Thank you. Um, I want to want to come back to to the question of, of trust that that um, Chris put on the table. Um, and, and Jocelyn also commented on Alex, you, you have been involved in um this set of issues for uh for many years and including um from brussels uh during the negotiation uh of the of the privacy shield itself what is your sense of how attitudes have evolved um in washington and in brussels um over the last years are are the governments in in a better place um or, or are we still in a, in a very difficult position? Uh, I mean, I'd say probably both. I mean, I think that we're in a better place in terms of um, mutual understanding and sort of like and the fact that we really have developed sort of a shared language with sort of the European Commission on these issues. I mean, we know a lot more now about sort of um, European Union law and jurisprudence in this area and sort of what, uh, best practices are that sort of like you know, EU member states um, do in terms of um, uh, surveillance. Um, and also, I mean, likewise, the commission has a greater understanding of sort of US law in this area and sort of our processes and how we do these things. And so I think that's really been valuable. I mean, this sort of development of sort of and deepening of this relationship where we know a lot more about one another right now and how uh, I would say that it's still difficult, um, but that's something of an external factor. I mean, where, yeah, certainly we are like, you know, likely to face legal challenge on this. And that sort of puts both the US government and the sort of European Commission in a difficult um, situation where we are trying to sort of address the concerns raised by the high court. Um, but I think that sort of as some have noted, I mean, this, um, executive order and sort of our like you know future um, adequacy determination i think this represents sort of the and the european union coming together in order to try to um balance sort of these concerns of national security and sort of um, privacy and civil liberties and to enable transatlantic commerce that is in both of our interests and i think that sort of throughout this thing i mean we have really i think come to understand that sort of i mean there isn't as much um delta between sort of um the way we approach these issues I mean, we have sort of different legal systems but ultimately um and also i think that's sort of why like i know the uh questions about sort of qualifying states is um not as sort of big an issue as others have uh, thought it is um just because i mean there is a great deal of similarity in terms of approaches between sort of what we do in the united states in terms of restraints and um limitations on surveillance and 
what EU member states do and what they're required to do under EU law. Thank you. Um, I see that we we're starting to get questions uh, coming in through through the Q and A feature, and I'm going to um, start to turn to those in just a moment. I encourage others to to, to send us their questions. Um, to to Chris um, on the topic of necessity and proportionality, um, the U.S. has notably uh, adopted uh, the wording that. Uh, the European Court of Justice uses to, to assess the relationship between means and ends in, um, in, in data protection uh, and surveillance. So it's a European standard, but the executive order is very clear that the US um, is going to apply it um, only in conformity with, with US law. Um, from from your reading of uh, the executive order, do you do you believe that the two parties have come to a substantive meeting of the minds on the meaning of uh, necessity and proportionality, and and how do you think the court of justice is is likely to uh, to dig into that particular question? Mm. I, I I love difficult questions. Thank you, Ken. Uh, <laughs> And I should say, I think Jocelyn raised a very good uh, point too. What are they going to call this new system? My my vote would be the data defender. That's what I suggest. So, yeah, I, to, I can answer that question now. I mean, it's basically it is going to be the EU US data privacy framework, and okay. so that will refer to sort of like you know both the sort of overarching national security commitments, but also there will be a specific mechanism that will sort of. Um, take that will fill the place in the privacy ecosystem that sort of privacy shield had and that will sort of have the commercial principles but um the way i like to think about it is you have this sort of overarching national security commitments that will cover data transfers under a variety of mechanisms and uh one of those will be sort of like a specific adequacy determination for this um, mm. framework i hope that helps clarify yeah that's that that's very useful information uh I think what's your question about necessity and proportionality, Ken, I think what's interesting is that if you if you ask any professor of comparative law, what are two, the two legal systems in the world in different geographic regions, which are the closest, they would probably say US and EU. They're generally regarded as very, very close systems. However, when it comes to constitutional principles, there are some significant differences. And one of those is the 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 the, uh, the European concept of proportionality, which grew out originally from German law and has spread to all sorts of other countries, India, South Africa, et cetera. But the one the one legal system it hasn't really penetrated is the U.S. Uh, from my my very cloudy recollection of of uh, studying U.S. constitutional law many years ago, you have the sort of the the strict scrutiny the in intermediate uh, scrutiny and, and the rational basis, et cetera, whereas EU uses this proportionality test of which necessities is part. So uh, this is really a kind of fundamental difference in approach between the two systems. And I, I did note with great interest that that the, e, that the US has seems to have done its homework and has put in not just the words proportionate and necessary into the in, into the order, but actually put in some of the elements of what we would consider to be uh, a proportionality and necessity from from European law. So that's that's good. I think what's what's going to be a bit interesting to to see is how does, for example, U.S. judges or U.S. authorities interpret this, in, in, interpret a concept in line with U.S. law when it doesn't really exist in U.S. law. I I, I don't want to to opine on, on how that's going to go. So uh, I, I, I think you can see this in two ways. You could say, oh, this doesn't work because they don't know that the concept doesn't exist in US law. You might also say, maybe this is the way legal bridges are built between systems that, that a concept, a for, kind of a foreign concept is introduced and it, it, it gradually becomes interpreted over time. And then over time, it, it sort of results in a bridge between the two systems. I don't know. I think it's certainly going to be challenging and, and questions will be raised about it. But I, I don't think we really have enough information at the moment to, to give a definitive answer to that question. 
But if I could just add, um, interject, I, I do think that the U.S., when they're conducting intelligence collection, bal does a balancing act. They've always been looking at what is, the, they, they regularly look at the national intelligence priorities framework. They're looking at that from a proportionality standpoint. We haven't used those words it, before. They are inherently European words. We use a relevant standard, a probable cause standard. We, we have different court um, language of con what is constitutionality. Um, but that said, the weighing and the balancing act of what is the least intrusive means in so many respects, what is, um, uh, a ballot is a balancing act that does happen. I think this memorializes that the intelligence community is going to need to further make balancing decisions in a more transparent way and that they're going to be held accountable to that and that not only at an individual level, but on a more um, holistic level where I think that's where the organization well, changes have to happen with respect to um, their policies and their procedures and the review of the P Club. I, th I think that will showcase what they already could do under existing law, even if there isn't a clear um, decision that holds that you can hold up that says it's this decision that per that requires a proportionality assessment. I I, I have I have to say I, I haven't reviewed the case law of recent, but I I do know that. Um, that the U.S. government is always weighing um, fundamental rights in in that respect. Thank you, Jocelyn. I I, I would just add that um, the balancing that that you're describing that the U.S. national security community goes through is is sort of at a systemic level, whereas um, the jurisprudence on the European side um, derives from fundamental rights and and so focuses on individuals and. So I think we're, we're, we're going to be somewhere in the middle uh, between these these two uh, approaches, and it'll be interesting. To see. I, I think you're right, Ken, because if you look at what is in the language of the EU of the of the executive order, it's not. It talks about it in terms of of people, not individuals. So I do think that that's going to be where we see the difference, and we're going to have to figure out what what comes out of that. Um, it, it is a, a difference that I think that we'll have to um, we'll have to see how that resonates. I mean, in reality, now we're being asked to look at individuals, and so um, I don't I don't I'm not sure about the interplay, Chris. And, and as as you say, um, we're we're starting to get. Um quite a lot of questions coming. If in. I may, very briefly, also to to complement on this point because I think it's. Go ahead, Elisa. On this point, because it's I think she froze. Elisa, you can can you hear us? We'll we'll, we'll come back to you um, on the, on that point in a minute. Um, I, I wanted to uh, mention several of the questions that have come in about the nature of the uh, the judicial redress body. Um, questions, can it be considered a court uh, within the meaning of uh, Article 47, the redress provision and the Charter of Fundamental Rights? Um, and a, a specific question uh, that has come to us from uh, Breton Dumaret uh, of the French uh, Data Protection Authority. Um, to what extent is there going to be a possibility for EU citizens to challenge uh, an order made by the Data Protection Review Court, which is, after all, an administrative body, to challenge that in, in U.S. federal court? That, that appears to be an issue that is not addressed in, in the specific EO. Um, Elisa, um, are you back with us? If so, um, I might ask you to... To, to comment on those in the first instance. Yes, I hope you can hear me now. Really sorry yes. about this. <laughs> okay, um, so yes, in, indeed, um, when it comes to the redress mechanism, I think it's important to perhaps take a step back and, and go back to, to the Schrems II judgment where uh, the Court of Justice looked at the, the ombudsperson, so the mechanism that was in place under the privacy shield and found that it was not 
sufficiently independent and that it did not have uh, sufficient investigatory and remedial powers. Um, and I've seen in, in, in the questions that are coming in, some you know, are, are saying that uh, is this new mechanism, is it an ombudsperson 2.0? Is, is it something that builds upon the ombudsperson? Um, so I wanted to be clear on this, that it's not. This is really a completely new mechanism, a new body um, that will have very specific safeguards in terms of its independence and will have more powers. So the, the Data Protection Review Court, it will be in the executive, but it's like an administrative tribunal. So the members will be um, individuals from outside of the US government. They will be appointed on the basis of specific qualifications, in particular taking into account the same criteria as the ones that are used to appoint federal judges in the US. Um, it will only be possible to dismiss them for cause, so for example, if they're mentally or physically unable to perform their tasks. Um, and I think one of the main important, important elements is that they will not receive instructions from the government. So they will adjudicate cases without any interference from the government in an independent and impartial way. Um, and the court will also have powers to investigate, so to obtain any relevant information and have powers to take binding decisions. So for example, ordering the deletion of data that was unlawfully collected. Um, I think this already shows that these are really significant improvements compared to the privacy shield where the ombudsperson was really a member of, of the administration. It was also reporting to, to political hierarchy and uh, did not have um, her own uh, powers to, to investigate or, or take decisions. Then as to the question of um, whether there would be a possibility to appeal decisions before the, the courts, before the ordinary courts, so to say, uh, the judicial branch, there, this is indeed not addressed in the executive order because it's not a specific question to, to this scenario. I would say that this would have to be dealt with under the rules that apply in general on, under US law. So for example, possibilities of, of judicial review. At the same time, we also know that in the area of national security, there are certain uh, limitations in particular because the individual will generally not know whether or not um, he or she has been subject to surveillance. So it makes it of course more difficult uh, to, to, to go to court. And actually, that's also precisely one of the main reasons why we went with this administrative tribunal, because before the judicial branch, you have these difficult questions of standing and uh, lack of information that the individual will have in an area of national security uh, with the data protection review court by working with a body that is in a way in the executive uh, we managed to overcome those issues. So for example, there's no standing requirements, there's no need to demonstrate that data has been collected or no need to demonstrate any, any harm. So um, working with this type of body was also a way to address some of the constraints that you would normally have uh, in, in the ordinary judicial system. Yeah, so um, it is, it is uh, a court created by uh, executive action uh, within uh, the executive branch. Um, Alex, two, two questions that, that sort of follow from that. Um, uh, there had been discussion at some point of legislation being sought by, by the US government to, to codify this creation uh, into, into US law. And, and to give it um, the, the long-term uh, durability that many in, in Europe are, are looking for. I was wondering first if you could uh, comment at all on uh, that possibility uh, of future congressional action. And, and second, um, uh, we've gotten questions um, asking for a bit more specificity on the the commercial privacy uh, principles and and how those may change, and also uh, whether the the range of companies that will be eligible to join uh, will be will be broadened. For example, will uh, will the banking industry, uh, which previously had not been able to avail itself of of uh, the privacy shield, be eligible for the new framework? So those two questions to you. Sure, and I guess like you know, one thing I would say just sort of on the redress mechanism, I mean, is that definitely this is a significant 
I mean, I helped set up the sort of um, privacy shield sort of ombudsperson process over at the State Department. And I can honestly say this is definitely goes much, much beyond that. And I mean, in our defense, um, at the time we were working with what we had available in terms of PPD 28. And so we were trying to build on that. But I would say the difference here is that sort of in terms of the Schrems 2 decision, um, the court gave us quite helpful guidance in terms of what we needed to be, um, what they found lacking in the redress mechanism under um, uh, the previous uh, framework. And so I think we really have used that guidance to meet the standards and the like, you know, um, criteria for independence and bindingness um, that they sort of laid out there. And so I think that's one difference here is that we've definitely had sort of like, you know, um, the court's decision to sort of guide our um, efforts to address it, um, which we didn't have sort of when we were doing the previous framework. Um, in terms of the commercial sort of aspects of it, I mean, I think that sort of by and large, uh, I mean, the Schrems 2 decision didn't uh, raise any concerns or issues with the commercial protections offered by the Privacy Shield framework. And that really hasn't been an issue. So, I mean, I don't think that there are sort of major commercial issues that need um, to be resolved at this point. Uh, I think that sort of like what we are looking at in terms of the principles that will, uh, the commercial principles that will be part of the uh, EU US data privacy framework will look quite um, uh, similar to sort of like uh, what uh, we've seen in the past with Privacy Shield. I mean, there are certainly some updates needed to be made. Um, Privacy Shield principles, we're still referring to the 95 directive, which is um, not um, extant anymore. And so certainly uh, references there will need to be updated and are being updated. Um, also, we had a number of um, annual reviews that resulted in changes to like how we operated the framework. And uh, we certainly wanted to reflect those and sort of the current state of the art of how we were managing um, Privacy Shield. Um, in terms of broadening the scope, I mean, I think that's something that we can discuss in the future. But I think right now we're sort of looking at um, trying to sort of maintain continuity and um, address sort of the national concern, security concerns raised in TRIMS too. Um, and so also I can sort of get a plug out there to say that sort of for the um, companies who have participated in Privacy Shield, we are definitely sort of committed to um, working with them to help them sort of transition um, their commitments over to the EU US data privacy framework. And um, we've really tried to be quite thoughtful in terms of the updates that we're making so that they won't sort of create um, new obligations on companies and that sort of things that have been working um, to date in the commercial sphere will not like you know, um, change. And so we're going to work with companies to ensure that they can sort of make a seamless transition there. Thanks. Well, we're coming down to the last few minutes in our discussion, and there's one there's one other topic that um, I'd like to um, to get thoughts on from from Chris and, and Jocelyn in particular, and that is uh, bulk data collection. Um, the uh, the agreement. Uh, clearly indicates, excuse me, the, the executive order, the U.S. commitments, uh, clearly indicate that the U.S. is going to continue to engage in, in bulk data collection uh, in, in certain circumstances that are um, more defined uh, than they have been previously. Um, bulk data collection at the same time has been uh, a, a difficult subject in, in European jurisprudence the Court of Justice has, has taken quite a restrictive view of it um, in respect of data retention uh, in, in law enforcement settings. Uh, there's also been uh, somewhat more accepting jurisprudence coming from, uh, from Strasbourg, from the European Court of Human Rights. Let's, let's Jocelyn first, um, how, how do you assess the, the bulk data restrictions that have been introduced? And, and then Chris, um, is this going to be a, a, a major issue um, in the eventual judicial evaluation here? Um, so, so I appreciate the fact that this our bulk collection is that is not going away. 
I would say um, it's not, it doesn't go away in other EU member states either. And I think there's an acknowledgement that that's going to continue at this point. And um, from, from my perspective, I think they've done a good job in trying to showcase where it's happening, the goal of using targeted collection first and um, really trying to set limits on retention, the purpose for it, the use of the data and any other kind of um, uh, intelligence limitation that they, that they can under, under circumstances. So I think they were very transparent in being able to do that. Um, and with respect to some sort of a assessment with the EU on the fact that intelligence communities do this type of activity, uh, you know, I can't speak to what will happen as a result. I, I guess I'd be interested in what Chris has to say there. I think you, I think corporations just want to stay out of this. They really don't have an ability to make any assessment about the validity of anything that's going on here. And I'm really hoping that that um, the agreement between the European Commission and the United States on the fact that this occurs and that they've taken all the steps that they can from a perspective of 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 really trying to move forward. We'll just have to see what happens, but I would hope that the regulators in, in the EU would be respectful of this um, agreement now once it's the adequacy comes out because it does put corporations in such a, a strange, odd place where they need to be assessing the legitimacy and lawfulness of bulk collection when they really just can't. And they just want, from a political perspective, the, you know the world to 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 take ownership the, the governments take ownership of these decisions and to allow companies to really then do everything in their power to make sure that the data is safe which is their obligation of course um and so um so I, I defer now to chris on his thoughts here chris the last word is yours oh yes well thanks a lot yeah that's that's a very difficult question. Indeed, the, the, the Court of Justice has been sort of, on the one hand, very strict with bulk collection. On the other hand, they've said it's not per se uh, impermissible. It can be done maybe under certain certain conditions, but I, I have no idea. I, I think anyone who's honest would say, uh, who, who's not a real expert on U.S. law enforcement legal requirements, I can't I can't tell based on this. We just have to see. I will at the end give you one free uh, suggestion for how to avoid this being invalidated by the court. Again, please do not include in the in the uh, in the final adequacy decision the language which was in the de decisions for the safe harbor and for the privacy shield, saying that the principles may be limited to the extent necessary for law enforcement public authority, national security, et cetera, that was in the, the safe harbor decision. The court invalidated it also based on that. Then they put it again back in the privacy de shield decision. And they also, the court cited it in that judgment uh, as, as a reason for in invalidating the privacy shield. So please don't, don't make this mistake a third time. Uh, on the commission side, from the US side, please don't insist on it because uh, it, it, it's, you're just going to be shooting yourselves in the foot again. That's my last word. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. And I'd also like to, uh, to thank each of our, uh, each of our panelists, Jocelyn, uh, Alex, and, and Elisa. We've, we've only skated over the surface here. There are um, many issues that are going to be emerging over time. And um, the Atlantic Council is going to continue to be engaged. On, on this subject. Uh, thanks to all our audience members who contributed questions. Goodbye for now. Thanks everybody.